Hi, my name is Phyllis Pollock, and I'd like to spend the next 45 minutes to an hour with you talking about implicit bias and more particularly how it has relates to the legal profession and how it has impacted the legal profession. And what I will discuss today or the outline today is the fact that we all have biases, the definition of implicit bias, samples from real life, types of implicit biases, and finally how to recognize implicit biases and to let them go. Uh, but first off, I'd like to show you a video uh, to bring home the assumptions uh, that we all make unconsciously. In the video, we all made a lot of assumptions, as you can see. Lots of people made assumptions about the judge, and the judge, likewise, was probably wondering um, what they were thinking about him. And what the video shows is that when we meet somebody, there are four implicit biases at work. What we assume about them, what we assume they are thinking about us, what they are assuming about us and what they think we are assuming about them. We all have biases and there's no way to get around it. There have been some studies um, in February of 2014, CNN uh, made a report on biases in babies indicating that babies are born with an innate, innate sense of right and wrong. And in a research by Yale researchers at the baby lab it found that more than 80% of babies as young as six months could choose between good and bad bunnies when this percentage increased to almost 90% in three-month-old babies. Uh, they also found that babies as young as seven months liked people with similar opinions that they had and disliked people with different opinions. In another study, uh, done by the, at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, they found that racism starts in babies as young as six to nine months. There were two studies. The first study paired happy music and sad music with photos of people, and the researchers found that nine-month-olds associated the happy music with photos of their own race and the sad music with photos of other races. In a second study, the babies watched videos uh, of people looking at in a certain direction and they found that the babies followed the, gla the gaze of those who were like them rather than the gaze of those who were not of their race. And these babies were six to eight months years old. Uh, there is a bias uh, that is known as the other race effect and what it is is that people are much better at recognizing faces of their own race than those of other races and uh, this tends to be universal 
that when you look at faces uh, of another race, they seem to all look alike to you. Uh, our assumptions, so as the slides show that we all need biases to survive, and our assumptions may not be real, they may be based on our own perceptions, and indeed they are based upon how we are viewing the world in front of us. In, in other words, our subjective lens through which we interpret the real, the, the real world as opposed to objectively. Um, as, the, as the slide indicates, our biases are subjective and are influenced not by what is actually in front of us, but by what we interpret to be in front of us. So this brings up the notion of cognitive biases and cognitive biases are in essence a systematic error of judgment. As we go through the day, we tend to be so overloaded with information that we need shortcuts in our brain, which are called heuristics, in order to process all the information. A synonym for heuristics would be a rule of thumb, a dogmatic assumption, or a presupp presupposition. The perfect example is how we drive from work home or home to work. When we first started at the job, we explored all the different ways and eventually we determined the best way to go to and from work. And at this point, it, we do it on automatic pilot and this is using our, um, our heuristic. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have been halfway home uh, from work and suddenly wake up and don't even recall how I had gotten that far. And as I said, this is our heuristic at work. Implicit bias, uh, a definition of implicit bias is that it is a preference for a group. It's something that operates outside of our awareness. It is based on st stereotypes and attitudes. We tend to develop early in life, as I indicated, the studies show that as young as six to eight to nine months, we will develop these biases and they tend to strengthen over time. Again, implicit biases refers to our beliefs, our attitudes, our behaviors. Occur, they occur automatically um, triggered by our system one thinking, which governs 80% of our thinking. And our biases can be both positive, negative, favorable, and unfavorable. And we all have them uh, as much as we may not want to admit it. Now, if you've read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, you would have come upon um, this notion of system one thinking and system two thinking. System one is our gut reactions. They operate automatically without effort. We, it causes us to jump to conclusions regarding a cause of something. Uh, it's our mental shortcuts that help us get through life. It's intuitive, it's involuntary and without effort. On the other hand, system two requires effort. It requires that we slow down, deliberate, concentrate, uh, reason, you know, think about it long and hard uh, in order to make the decision. Examples of system one would be calculating two by two, detecting the relative distance of two objects, reading words on a billboard, uh, detecting danger, which is the uh, old good old uh, fight or flight response that is very automatic in all of us. System two thinking, and I would like you to try to do this without a piece of paper or a pencil, is to calculate 17 times 24 in your head, paying attention to this presentation, especially since it's on Zoom, which requires more concentration. Uh, reading a book uh, with comprehension, presenting an oral argument in court, or sitting and analyzing the pros and cons of an issue. Now, for those of you who have tried to multiply 17 times 24 in your head, the answer is 408. We all have a lot of implicit biases, and I have set out um, several of them here for you to look at. The one about height is very interesting because it states that 57% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are over six foot two, even though the general population uh, is only 16% of those over six foot. 
and indeed all of our presidents have tended to be over six foot. The last one, the Hairstyles or, or the Crown Act is a recent one that has been recognized. The Crown is an acronym that stands for creating a respectful and open workplace for natural hair. And it was signed by Governor Newsom in California on July 3, uh, 2019. And the notion of hairstyles as being uh, an implicit bias came to the fore uh, in approximately December of 2018 in a news article about a New Jersey high school wrestler. And he was in a match and he had dreadlocks and the white referee uh, gave him an ultimatum to either cut his dreadlocks or to forfeit the match. And he did cut the dreadlocks in order to proceed with the match. But this uh, notion of hairstyle and discriminating against hairstyle has appeared in federal cases. There were cases uh, in the 80s and 90s about airline attendants who were not uh, hired by an airline because they were wearing um, dreadlocks or textured styles uh, such as locks or braids or twists and there were other types of cases that were filed under the rubric of sex discrimination um, and in all of those cases the potential employee lost because the characteristic was not immutable that is it was a mutable characteristic and so did not qualify as being sex discrimination. So, but as a result of this New Jersey article in 2018, um, a law professor at Sam Samford University, Professor Green, got together with some legislators in various states and who, who sponsored the Crown Act. And the Crown Act is now uh, a statute in New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Washington State, Colorado, and is also in effect in Montgomery County, Maryland, and in Cincinnati, and other states are considering it. In California, it amends the Fair Employment and Housing Act and the Education Code to say that it is discriminatory to take action based on hair texture and styles, and it defines race to include hair text to include protective hairstyles such as braids, locks, and twists. And so this is, uh, as I said, the most recent law, I think, on the books. So there have been biases in the legal profession, and I would like to go over them with you. Uh, the first one I would like to discuss is the beauty bias or the notion of being attractive versus being unattractive. In May of 2010, Professor Deborah Rhodes published a book entitled The Beauty Bias, and in it she comments this commented that just as many think that it may hurt to be beautiful, it also hurts not to be beautiful. And she noted that appearances do influence judgments about competence, job performance, uh, which in turn will affect one's income and status. And if a woman is not attractive, her resume will get a less favorable assessment, thereby affecting her ability to get hired and promoted, and she will end up earning less uh, even where the, her appearance has nothing to do with the job, such as being a lawyer. And equally, if a woman is too attractive, she will pay a penalty for that because people will deem her uh, too attractive, too distracting, too sensual, and probably not too bright. Think about Marilyn Monroe and Some Like It Hot, and think about the stereotype in the movie Legally Blonde, uh, where the blonde attends Harvard law school, which probably created some cognitive dissonance uh, in your mind. This uh, attractiveness bias or beauty bias still exists. There was an article in Forbes in July of 2019 uh, confirming that, confirming its existence uh, at this, in this day and time. It noted that physically attractive individuals are likely to be interviewed for jobs and hired uh, more often to advance more rapidly through more frequent promotions and to earn higher wages than unattractive individuals. Indeed, it noted that the above average beauty equates to a 10 to 15% higher salary 
than below average beauty. Um, the article also mentioned that the Chinese Navy had a requirement of, quote, good looks um, to, to be a member of the Navy or to join the Navy, and that Abercrombie and Fitch settled a $50 million lawsuit for hiring uh, associates that tended to be WASPy, that is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. However, the settlement agreement did not bar them from using that criteria in the future. This bias also exists in education. Uh, studies have shown that physically attractive students tend to obtain higher grades because they are deemed more conscientious simply because they're better looking, even though in reality that may not be so. Uh, this attractiveness has also helped them get into university. They get more favorable evaluations in college admission interviews, et cetera. And this attractiveness bias even uh, applies in K uh, through 12, where again, the attractive student uh, is deemed to be smarter, more honest, and driven. Even in reality, uh, the high school student or the middle school student may not be so. Closely related to this beauty bias is a gender bias or how female lawyers are portrayed versus male attorneys. Um, there was a 1994 Law Review article that indicate that looked at uh, female lawyers in movies and found that a woman lawyer typically in the movie could not have it all. That is, she could not win both personally and professionally. Um, she could not be a hero the way the male attorney who could win the case and uh, get the woman. Uh, if she won, typically if the woman lawyer won the case, she did it at uh, great personal sacrifice to herself, such as the end of a love affair, disillusionment with the law or with her client. So she would win the case, save, save the day for the client, but lose personally. And more times than not, the law review article noted that she typically needed a male attorney to come to her rescue or help bail her out uh, or get her out of the a bind to save the day. Uh, as I noted, in contrast, the male lawyer would win typically both personally and professionally, that is win the case and get the girl. And to give you some examples, think about uh, the Pelican Brief where the Tulane Law student needed the help, help of males or think about the movie Aaron Brockovich, where the female paralegal again needed the help of a male attorney. You also more recently had the movie A Marriage Story, where, Laura, where the Laura Dern character um, played the female family lawyer. Think about her attributes and would they have been better had it been a male or more acceptable if those attributes were in a male attorney. Uh, this discrepancy or discrimination or implicit bias also shows up in TV shows. If you think about Suits, L.A. Law, Ally McBeal, and particularly Law and Order, in all of the episodes of Law and Order, the uh, district attorney has always been a male. Sam Waterston has always been the executive assistant DA or the DA, and his assistants have always been female. When you think about women lawyers, think about the fields of law that they have tended to gravitate to, such as family, real estate, corporate employment, or transactional. I mean, think about how many women uh, lawyers are there that are, let's say, trial lawyers trying very complex corporate matters. Also think about the attributes that are applauded in a male, yet may not be, yet may be frowned upon in a female, such as aggressiveness, directness, confrontational, no-nonsense, independent, exceptionally smart, or very competent. Whereas the male attorney with these attributes might be characterized as a tough attorney and one who you would want to hire to represent you, uh, the female counterpart may be labeled either with the B word or with the C word or otherwise denigrated um, when, uh, when commented upon. And, you know, with respect to partners, uh, the women have not fared so well. In 2012, uh, the number of women partners of color in 2019 were, in 2019 were only 3.5%. 
uh, overall in 2019, the number of women partners or those women who were, who were promoted to partner were 24%. Only 11% though were equity partners. If you look at the Fortune 500, as of September 10, 2020, uh, only 39 uh, of the Fortune 500 CEOs were women. So even in this day, um, women are not really in the ranks of government of governance in uh, law firms or in the Fortune 500 companies. The next uh, category is obesity, and studies have shown that there is a significant bias existing against female obese defendants in the courtroom. The researchers created, uh, in one study, the researchers created a mock jury using 471 participants and showed them four photos, the same female, both skinny and obese, and the same male, both skinny and obese, and accused them of check fraud. The 471 participants who were the mock jurors were supposed to select using the photos, the ones that they thought were guilty of the check fraud. And it turned out that the male participants rated the obese female defendants guilty more times than not, uh, or more times than the lean female defendant of the check fraud. That is the men were very less accepting of or forgiving of overweight female defendants. And there was also another study done that showed that physically attractive defendants tended to be judged more leniently than their less attractive counterparts and indeed uh, given um, less onerous sentences. Um, there was also this um, implicit bias of obesity also is in the medical profession. There was a study of 358 nurse practitioners at a national conference about their attitude and beliefs regarding obese individuals. And the study found that these nurse practitioners had negative beliefs. They perceived these individuals um, to be not as good or as successful as others, not fit for marriage, to be messy or not as healthy. There was also another study of 250 physicians and found that 40% of them reported a negative reaction towards a patient that was obese. But the one study that got me the most was one of primary care physicians. It was a study of 620 of them, and it found that 50% of them regarded patients with obesity as being awkward, unattractive, ugly, and non-compliant, and uh, more importantly, spent less time uh, with the obese patient. The study found that these doctors spent about 31 minutes with thin patients, 25 minutes with these moderately overweight patients, and only 22 minutes with those who are extremely overweight. That is, they spent about nine minutes less with the obese patient than they did with the average weight patient. The next bias I wanna talk about is what I would call a relationship bias that stems from an Iowa case called Nelson v. Knight. Um, decided by the Iowa Supreme Court in 2013. And it's sort of, it's, it's somewhat tragic and amusing at the same time. Um, the Supreme Court took pains uh, in rendering its decision to avoid the notion of sex discrimination, saying that the case was all about relationships. And what had happened is Dr. Knight had hired a dental assistant, Ms. Nelson, and they soon started having a relationship. Well, Mrs. Knight, that is the Dennis White's wife, saw some text messages on, hub, on Hubby's phone between, the, between Hubby and Miss Nelson and told her husband, the good dentist, that uh, Miss Nelson was a big threat to the marriage. So the dentist terminated Miss Nelson in the best interest of not only his marriage, but of hers as well. So she sued on one count of sex discrimination, urging that had she been a male, this would not have happened. The, and the dentist filed a motion for summary judgment, which the trial court granted and the Iowa Supreme Court affirmed, again saying it was all about the relationship 
having nothing to do with sex discrimination. So my inquiry is, was the court itself uh, implicitly biased in rendering this decision? The next one that I would like to talk about is um, just the, some statistics on LGBTQ. The Association for Legal Career Professionals uh, comes out with a survey and it found that in 2019, uh, about 2.9% of the lawyers self-identified as being LGB, LGBTQ lawyers. Um, there are approximately 3,028 attorneys in the United States so self-identifying. As you can imagine, uh, the majority of them are in four cities, New York City, Washington, D.C., L.A., and San Francisco. Um, with respect to disability, um, the same uh, survey found that less than 1% of the partners and less than one half percent of the associates identified self-identified as having a disability uh, in 2019. The next one, arbitrators, is very interesting uh, when it comes to implicit bias and women. In 2018, uh, the ABA, the American Bar Association magazine, published an article entitled, Where Are the Women Arbitrators? The Battle to Diversify ADR. It noted that even though in the last 25 years, approximately 50% of the law school classes uh, were 50% women, women represented only 33% of the federal judges and only 25% of the state judges. Yet when it comes to arbitration and particularly arbitrating uh, significant commercial matters, less than 15% of the arbitrators turned out to be women. And then in a 2014 ABA survey regarding women arbitrators, it found that um, depending upon the subject matter, there were either a lot of women arbitrators or very little. For example, uh, women arbitrators were 57% when it came to family, elder, and probate matters. They were 48% when it came to consumer matters. 37% when it came to labor and employment matters, 21% when it came to class actions, 18% when it came to corporate or commercial matters, 14% when it came to construction, 9% when it came to insurance matters, and 7% when it came to intellectual property. So the more complex or sophisticated the matter, um, the less percentage of arbitrators were women. And the study also showed that when the matter in dispute was 10, 1 to 10 million, 89% of the arbitrators were men. And when the matter in dispute was 1 billion or more, only 4% uh, were arbitrators. So again, the higher the stakes, the more complex the matter, uh, the more likely that the arbitrator would be male. Uh, this past spring in May, the American Bar Association section on dispute resolution held its virtual uh, conference and I attended a session entitled, um, I attended a session entitled Unconscious Bias um, and uh, Unconscious Bias in, in the Mediation Field. And it was put on by Homer LaRue and Alan uh, Simonet, and they discuss statistics about men, about arbitrators, and the uh, selection of arbitrators. And all of this came about probably in, or came to a head in 2019, when there was a dispute stemming from a $200 million sale of a clothing line by Jay-Z otherwise known as Sean Carter. And the agreement uh, provided for arbitration. And so they went to the American Arbitration Association. They got a list of 200 arbitrators from their large and complex case roster. And Jay-Z found that only three of them were African-American, one of which was disqualified. So he filed a motion in New York State Court to stay the arbitration until something could be worked out. And eventually it was. But this notion that 
uh, there were very, very few and far ar uh, black arbitrators um, to be selected, brought all of this notion of diversity uh, to a head. And as I said, this was probably the reason why this uh, seminar was brought on, was, was presented by Homer LaRue and Alan Simonet entitled Unconscious Bias and the Selection of Neutrals. And they are going to publish an article in the Howard Law Journal uh, about this entitled Diversity and Inclusion in Arbitrator Selection or I, I Select Who I Know. And I assume it's going to come out within the coming months. What they found was that through 2019 uh, in the National Academy of Arbitrators, there were only 1,408 there were only 1,488 members, but of this, only 43% were uh, persons of color, and of this, some were inactive, retired, or deceased. So what this means is about 2.8% of the arbitrators in this academy were diverse. Uh, what they found in doing their research is that when people selected arbitrators, they tended to select who they knew and who looked like them. So it ended up being white elderly males more times than not. They looked at uh, various selections and they found that if four people are put on a list to be selected and one of them is diverse, the inference is typically that that one person is incompetent and is the odd person out. He doesn't look like the others, so he does not get selected. If there are two women on that list of four, then the odds are about 79% that a woman will be selected. Uh, on a, what they found if on that same list of four people, if two are of color, then the odds will jump to 193% that a person of color will be selected. What they found is that on any given list, if at least 30% of the list is diverse or people of color or of some other minority, um, then there is a very good chance that they will be selected. Another study uh, focused on the chances of a woman being hired for a university teaching position. There were 598 finalists and they were given lists of four. And what the study found is on the list of four, if there were three women and one man, then the woman had a 67% chance of being selected. If there were two women and two men, then there was a 50% chance of being selected. One woman and three men, then there was a zero chance. There, um, it was also determined that this implicit bias or lack of diversity was in the NFL. Uh, in 2002, data showed that although 60% of the players were black, only 6% of the head coaches were black. And so they came up with what was called or is called the Rooney Rule, named after the then chairman of the Steelers, Dan Rooney. And what it required was that at least one minority candidate uh, be interviewed for the head coaching vacancy. vacancy. In mid-May of last year, or this year rather, um, the rule was amended to now require that at least two candidates from outside the organization for any vacant head coaching job be interviewed and at least one minority candidate from outside the organization for any vacant offensive, defensive, or special team coordinated job be interviewed. It also required that minorities and female applicants be interviewed for the executive or head office positions. However, I did hear a story on CNN recently saying that the Rooney Rule has not worked. 70% um, of the players are black, yet there are only three black coaches. This, this notion of trying to diversify has also uh, affected the legal profession. In 2018, uh, Diversity Labs, which is an entity in San Francisco, had approximately um, 42 law firms agree to at least consider uh, minorities or diverse lawyers, um, at least 30% rather, of diverse lawyers for government, for governance and leadership roles. And 
as of July of 2020, 117 law firms have signed on that they will uh, consider at least 30% of diverse lawyers to be partners or other governing roles within the law firms. Uh, the panels, the alternative dispute resolution panels though, have not signed on to this. Uh, JAMS, ADR services, AAA, uh, Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service have not agreed to consider at least 30% 30, 30 uh, diverse lawyers uh, in their governance and leadership rules. Triple, uh, the AAA, the American Arbitration Association, in 2019 did agree to have 20% diverse candidates on its list of neutrals, and it says that it meets this at least 90% of the time. Um, so that is um, the topic about arbitrators uh, and minorities. Um, the next I'd like to talk about is the pay gap and it, unfortunately, it indeed exists. If you take the ratio of women's pay, including all races and all ethnicities, and compare it to men, it averages about 81 cents to the dollar. And if you break it down by race, you find that white women earned about 78 cents to, a, to every dollar that a male earned in 2018. Black women earned about 54 cents to every dollar that a white male earned in 2018. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, black women earned 61 cents. Hispanic women earned 54 cents. And Asian women did a little bit better. They earned 90 cents to every dollar that a white male earned. Uh, and as you probably recall, there is the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of, of 2009 which prohibits wage discrimination based on age, religion, sex, race, national origin, disability. Um, the, it was a decision in the Supreme Court that said the 180 day statute ran from the first paycheck discrepancy. The Supreme Court said no, uh, the 180 day statute of limitations runs from each paycheck. And then the final bias, uh, one of the final biases I'd like to talk about is tattoos. Um, research has revealed that 40% of the millennial uh, generation has tattoos and about 30% uh, of those with tattoos have them in a visible place. And indeed in 2012, the California Lawyer Magazine had an article called Tattoos as Evidence, and it was about a Florida defendant who was on trial for murder, and he had a swastika and a barbed wire tattooed on his shaved head. So they brought a makeup artist in every morning to cover it up to ensure that he would have a fair trial. Um, think about how twos do affect a judge, a jury, a prosecutor, a potential employer. I know that um, when I have a mediation and there may be a plaintiff with tattoos, uh, I might take the attorney aside and say something to at least make him think about how that may affect a potential jury uh, if they go to trial. Um, tattoos have also been an issue in the military. In 2013, the military attempted to tighten up on uh, the visibility or the wearing of tattoos or body art banning them below the knee and the elbow. And what they found is that it affected the recruitment population because those who they recruited were between the ages of 18 and 29. And this is the very population in which 40% of them had tattoos. So in 2019, the military loosened the regulations and just simply said that the tattoos could not be racist, extremist, or sexist uh, and you know let it go at that. The another bias that I want to talk about is a generational bias and this chart shows how the different generations uh, look at things differently. Um, Generation X, Generation Y, baby boomers, <clears throat> a World War II um, vets will view life differently and this can create a conflict 
uh, we make different assumptions based upon uh, the times that we grew up in and we have different values. You know, an example is using a mobile phone during a meeting. Um, a senior or a baby boomer may think it rude to pull out the mobile phone and start texting um, or doing something else with it, sending an email on thinking or on the basis that they should be devoting their full attention to the speaker or to what's going on at the meeting. But the Generation X or Generation Y who is using that mobile phone will say, well, gee, I'm just trying to be efficient and I am multitasking, uh, trying to get as much done as possible. In reality, they're not multitasking because if you think about what I mentioned earlier about system one and system two thinking, it turns out that we cannot do uh, two system two thoughts at the same time. We can do a system one and a system two, but you can't do a system, but you cannot do two system two and you actually become inefficient uh, if you attempt it. So the uh, younger generation who are trying to do two system two things at the same time are basically fooling themselves. Um, going on, How do these biases show up? Well, first of all, they show up in prosecutional discretion. And over the eight months, over the last eight or 10 months, uh, we have had load, loads of examples of unarmed black individuals uh, being um, killed by the police. And sometimes the police officers are prosecuted and sometimes they are not. For example, think about Trevin Martin uh, in his case, the jury said race had nothing to do with it, and many felt otherwise. And indeed, the Stanton police did not charge Mr. Zimmerman uh, with, the, with the killing originally. It was only after a firestorm uh, protest did the governor appoint a special prosecutor and the state got involved. And, and then there was a not guilty verdict. Uh, there was also, we can go all the way back to 1921 to the Tulsa massacre, massacre in, which, in which hundreds were massacred and no one was held to account for it. Um, more recently, you had the shooting of Amon Aubrey, a jogger in Georgia in February of this year. Two different DAs declined to prosecute the white father and son who shot them on the grounds that he thought he was a burglar. And it was finally in April of 2020 that a third DA agreed to prosecute or take the matter to a grand jury. And they finally arrested the father and son. Uh, more recently, you had uh, the issue of Breonna Taylor, where the, uh, of the three officers, only one was indicted, but he was indicted for negligently endangering um, the neighbors in the apartments next to Brianna Taylor. Uh, no one was indicted for the actual killing of Brianna Taylor. Uh, so there are just picking up the newspaper. I think uh, any given day uh, we will hear tales of prosecutional discretion and how these implicit biases uh, show up. You, you know, even when you talk about defunding the police or reforming the police to become more community oriented uh, and more sensitive to this implicit bias. Uh, but moving on, it also shows up in change of venue requests um, as well. And it also shows up during hearings. In March of 2020, uh, the California Commission on Judicial Performance reprimanded Judge Bennett in Ventura County for co commenting on, quote, smoking hot, end quote, women for proclaiming in front of a prosecutor and an attorney in a hallway that he had the quote, biggest balls in the courthouse, end quote, in the courthouse for telling a black defendant to stop chucking and jiving in response to what the judge thought was non-responsive uh, non answers to his questions. And then he also told a prosecutor after a hearing that she didn't have to act like a scared little girl in her courtroom. Um, think about how this language will affect uh, those uh, sitting in the courtroom, such as clients or other attorneys. Then there was also another uh, story uh, in May of 2020, the New Jersey Supreme Court removed a judge from the 
bench and permanently barred him from ever presiding in a courtroom um, after suggesting to a woman who, seeking a restraining order of, against uh, one who had allegedly sexual assault or had sexually assaulted her that she should close her legs. Um, she, the woman uh, filed for a restraining order and in the, and in the course of the hearing, the judge asked her if she knew how to stop someone from having intercourse and she said, yes, run away. And he said, what about closing your legs? He was permanently uh, barred or removed from the bench. He was also sued by one of his ex-law clerks uh, on sex discrimination. And he ended up quietly settling for $250,000. Uh, in terms of judge's language, I saw a case recently, a Connecticut federal judge refused to recuse himself uh, after he, insisting on using the term transgender, transgender female rather than male in a lawsuit that was brought by a conservative, conservative Christian nonprofit group. Uh, it followed on behalf of some uh, high school female runners seeking to ban from the team uh, the transgender females. In the complaint, the plaintiffs used the term uh, males uh, rather than transgender females, and the judge refused um, to use the term male, stating that he would use the term transgender female instead. And the plaintiff claimed that by the use of the language, uh, he had prejudged the case. In terms of sentencing, um, it also shows up. Um, think about the Varsity Blues case, and this may have something to do with white privilege. Uh, Lori Laughlin, Laughlin and her husband uh, paid $500,000 to get their children into the University of Southern California, and she only got two months uh, in prison. Felicity, Felicity Huffman, uh, who paid $15,000, uh, only got 11 days or 14 days, reduced to 11 days. And then I also read uh, where two black women uh, got five years each. One of the black women uh, put down a false address or an address in a different school district in order to get her child into the better school while the other woman voted illegally or was not eligible to vote. And as I said, they each got five years um, in, uh, in terms of um, for what they had done. In terms of jury selection, the Ninth Circuit in January of 2014, in the case of Smith Klein Beecham versus Abbott Labs, uh, issued an opinion uh, in which the issue was whether a party could use a peremptory challenge to oust a openly gay juror in a case involving HIV drugs. Uh, as you may suspect, the Ninth Circuit said no, uh, it was a denial of equal protection. And so the peremptory challenge was not well was not well taken. And so as this indicates, the implicit bias can come out in all uh, different aspects of litigation and the legal system. So um, before we get to steps to uh, in terms of recognizing it, I also want to point out that at least in California, the legislature has taken pains to try to sensitize people to implicit bias. Um, effect of January 1, 2020, uh, the State Bar of California is required to adopt regulations requiring attorneys to take courses on implicit bias and the promotion of bias reducing strategies uh, for each compliance period starting after January 31, 2023. And it also requires court personnel interacting with the public to take two hours of such training uh, again of, uh, every two years, effective January 1, 2020, 2021. And the California legislature also passed a civil code section regarding damages, which prohibits the calculation of past, present, and future lost earnings or impaired earning capacity uh, based on race and gender as well. And 
the California legislature also has imposed on uh, physicians and surgeons and also on nurses assistants to also take implicit bias training and how their implicit bias impacts uh, their judgment in terms of medical treatment. And then as of September 30, uh, Governor Newsom signed a, a statute uh, requiring that uh, the 600 and some odd boards, uh, public corporation, that their boards uh, have at least one or more directors uh, of under uh, of under representative uh, community uh, representing the under underrepresented community uh, that is either Black, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, uh, Asian, and etc. And if the board is four to nine directors, they should have one. If it's more than nine, then they need, I think, at least three directors. And he also signed laws uh, talking about jury selection to uh, prohibit the use of a peremptory challenge uh, on in jury selection uh, for uh, to prohibit uh, peremptory challenge on those in terms of racial racially biased, and also to allow a judge to overturn a verdict that he thinks he or she thinks may be racially biased. So there is legislation afoot in California and probably elsewhere to try to sensitize us all to the implicit bias. So how to recognize and to let go of it? Well, first, I think we need to recognize that it is impossible to escape it, that we all have it, uh, no matter how much we think otherwise, and that we should confront it confront our biases and our predispositions. We should familiarize ourselves with other cultures, uh, understand that there is more than one way to do something and that there are different ways to do it and they all may be correct. Again, awareness and intent to become aware of our limiting beliefs, to reframe our beliefs, uh, to give ourselves a little nudge and get us to stop and think about what we're about to do and whether it does show an implicit bias and then to reframe and change the direction of our thinking and of our actions. And so with that, I end the presentation and I thank you very much.